Our second author for the course is Immanuel Kant. The uh, second book we're reading is The Groundwork for the Metaphysics of Morals. Like Aristotle, Kant is not easy to read, so be sure to give yourself lots of time to do the readings, especially the second reading assignment. It's longer than normal, so make sure to plan for that. Like Aristotle, Kant is massively influential. Like Aristotle, Kant is here uh, in large part because he's going to serve as our introduction to one of the main kinds of moral theories. So Aristotle was a virtue ethicist, and Kant is a deontologist. So that's the first topic we're going to talk about. What is deontology or deontological ethical theories? So I think there's sort of two good ways to think about what is a deontological ethical theory. And again, recall from, I think, the first lecture or one of the first lectures, categories like deontology and virtue ethics are not perfect, clear-cut divisions. It's not always obvious which category a moral theory goes into. So do not place too much weight on this sort of category. But these are labels to help us think about things. And so for deontology, what are these moral theories about? So one way to think about what are they about is the idea of duties. So a deontological moral theory is one that thinks about morality as a set of duties, things that you have to do, things that uh, you ought to do. So morality tells you that you have a duty to be kind to others, or morality tells you that you have a duty not to kill, or things like this. So a deontological moral theory is effectively like a list of duties. That's one way of thinking about it. Another way of thinking about it is that deontological moral theories are focused on the idea of rights. And what is a right? Well, a right is something that sort of somebody has or some entity has, and it tells us how we are allowed to treat that entity. So for instance, if I have a right to life, this means you're not allowed to kill me except maybe in certain circumstances, like if I'm trying to take away your right to life by attacking you. If I have a right to freedom of religion, this means you're not allowed to stop me from practicing my religion, things like that. I might also have a right which tells you you have to do things for me. So for instance, if I have a right to uh, health care, then you have to maybe pay taxes so that I can be provided health care by the government. Or maybe if you're a doctor, you have to treat me if uh, you're able to. So rights are sort of things that tell us how we have to treat others or what we owe to others. And maybe humans can have rights. Maybe non-humans can have rights too. Maybe, for instance, a dog can have rights or a tree can have rights. Maybe groups can have rights, you know, whatever. The thought is deontolog deontological moral theories are ones built around the idea of rights. And notice both of these ways of thinking, duties and rights, are kind of equivalent to each other. So if something has rights, this generates duties. So if I have a right to life, you have a duty not to kill me. Or if you look at it in the other direction, if there's a duty, then there's some sort of corresponding right. So if I have a duty, not to steal from people, then they have a right to property or a right not to be stolen from or something like this. So broadly, that's what deontological theories are about. They're about duties or they're about rights, and in fact, those are kind of the same thing. A third way which some people sometimes talk about deontological theories is the idea of rules or the idea of moral principles. So the thought is a deontological theory gives you a list of moral rules or a list of moral principles to follow. And you can sort of understand why people might talk about this because it seems like duties or rights are basically lists of rules or a list of principles that you have to follow. I think it's clearer to think about it in terms of duties or rights than it is to think about it in terms of rules. The idea of a rule is kind of uh, very general and it doesn't really link up to morality as much as the idea of a duty or a right does, similarly for principles. So there are rules in the game of cricket, but we don't think there are duties in the game of cricket or rights in the game of cricket or something. So I think duties and rights are just clearer ways of talking. But, um, you know, since a duty or a right kind of seems like some sort of rule or some sort of principle, uh, 
maybe that's another way of thinking about a deontological ethical theory. If you think back to Aristotle, Aristotle was very clear that morality cannot be encoded in a set of principles or a set of rules. Aristotle didn't think morality worked like that. And so you might think that Aristotle kind of disagrees with the deontologists because he doesn't think you can come up with rules for morality. And I mean, this is one reason I don't use rules to de describe deontology. You could be a deontologist who thinks there are duties and there are rights, but that we can't come up with like an easy set of rules for talking about the duties or for talking about the rights. So this doesn't have to be a disagreement that the deontologist has with Aristotle. But many deontologists do think that morality can be encoded in a set of principles, and Kant is one of those. So Kant, we're going to see, does have one moral principle, or he's got three, but he says they're all the same principle you'll see when you read. So Kant thinks morality can be encoded in principles. And in fact, they're relatively simple principles that everybody kind of already knows and understands. And so this is a big disagreement with Aristotle. Aristotle doesn't think you can just write out the principles of morality, and Kant and some other deontologists do. So that's one good thing to keep in mind. Here's a division between one of the moral theories we've seen so far, the only one, virtue ethics, Aristotle's specifically, and then the one we're about to see, Kant's deontology. So that's deontology. The second point, and related to this, is that Kant is going to help us think more about three sorts of things that might matter in morality. So when we think about morality, what's the right thing to do? What's the ethical thing to do? We might think about what sort of intention should you have? I might think morality is about having the right intentions. If I'm trying to do the right thing, then I'm doing the moral thing. Morality is about sort of having the right will or having the right goal or having the right desires or having the right intentions. So that's one sort of view of morality. This sort of morality says, basically, you can be a very moral person even if you get very unlucky. So for instance, I could have good intentions, and so I give you some medicine to cure you, but it has terrible results. Uh, you had some sort of strange illness that seemed like one illness, but it turned out to be another, and so I accidentally kill you. If morality is about intention, I did the right thing. I'm not a bad person. I'm a good person. I tried to help you. If morality is about results, so the sort of second contrast in this threefold division, if morality is about results, oof, I did something very wrong. I did the wrong thing by giving you the medicine. So there's this big divide in morality between people who think it's your intentions that matter and people who think the results are what matter. Kant is very clearly on the intention side of the debate. He thinks the only thing that matters are your intentions. He thinks, look, getting unlucky can't get you the morally bad, it can't make you morally bad. What matters is that you tried to do the right thing. You intended to do the right thing. And I've been talking about intention versus result, but actually there's a third option, character. So we might say, look, it's not about your intention in the moment. It's not about the result that you achieve. It's about the sort of person you are. Morality is not about one particular action in isolation or the result of that action. It's about being a good person. And of course, the good person will have good intentions and they'll typically achieve good results. But morality is not about making like a list of the right intentions or a list of the right as results. Morality is about figuring out what the good person is and then everything flows from that. And we've seen this already. This is Aristotle's view. Aristotle doesn't ignore intentions. He talks about the right sorts of intentions to have, but he figures out the right sorts of intentions by looking at what is the good person and what sort of intentions would the good person have. And so for him, character is what matters in morality, not the result that you achieve. Although, of course, if you can't achieve a good result, then you don't have a good character and not about the intentions, although again, if you have the wrong intentions, you'll have the wrong character, but fundamentally it's about character. And for Kant, that's much less important. For Kant, what matters is your intention. When we get to our third moral theory, utilitarianism, they only care about results. They don't care about your intention or your character. 
So this is a threefold divide in morality, and it's a very important one, and we'll want to keep this in mind throughout the whole course. Kant is going to be defending the first part. We've seen Aristotle defend the third part, and then Mill will defend the second part. The third point to keep in mind, and this is less about deontology, oh, sorry, and deontologists are generally in the intentions category. The third point is less about deontology and more about Kant's project specifically. So with Kant, we have the division between a priori things and a posteriori things. This will come up on the first reading quiz and it'll get explained in more detail. But a priori things are things you can know sort of without doing empirical investigation into the world. You can know them just by thinking about them. Whereas a posteriori things are things that you can only figure out by doing empirical investigation into the world. And for Kant, the kind of morality he's interested in in this book, the one we're going to read, is entirely a priori. This book is about what can we figure out about morality a priori. Kant doesn't think this is the entirety of morality. There is a posteriori stuff to say about morality. But the most important stuff is in this book, and it's a priori. And a way of thinking about this, uh, I guess my display is a little cut off here, the way of thinking about this is that, oh, it's still cut off. Hmm. Still a little cut off. Now it's very small. All right. Problem solved. The way of thinking about this is that um, we can think about things with what Kant calls pure reason. Pure reason is reason that's not about uh, the uh, principles in the actual world. It doesn't require empirical investigation. Or we can think about things sort of empirically, uh, with empirical reason, maybe. And that's about things uh, that require investigation into the actual world. And in both pure reason and empirical reason, we can divide things into practical reason and theoretical reason. Practical reason is about what to do, or, yeah, I mean, basically, there's other stuff, but basically it's about what should I do. Theoretical reason is stuff not related to action, so like figuring out a math problem would be theoretical pure reason. Why? Well, because it's non-empirical. You don't have to do any investigation into the world. And it's not about practical matters. It's not about what to do. It's just about theoretical stuff. And you can divide empirical stuff into those categories, too. So there's practical reason. So that's empirical investigation into what to do. So for instance, if I'm trying to cure my patient and I need to figure out what medicine to give them, I want to use practical reason to do this. And Kant thinks there's also basically theoretical reason about empirical matters. So uh, figuring out the orbit of the planets maybe would be empirical theoretical reason. So why am I bringing all, this, all these distinctions up and all this stuff? So two things. Number one, it's interesting to say that we can talk about morality, and in fact the bulk, the most important part of morality, just by using pure reason or uh, a priori reason or non-empirical reason. It's interesting to say that can solve moral questions for us. Why is that interesting? Well, it disagrees, for instance, with Aristotle. If you think about how Aristotle answers moral questions, he says, look, we have to find out how human beings work. Morality is about eudaimonia, about being a good human. And so we have to figure out what is a good human life and how do we figure that out? We investigate the sort of creature that a human being is and find out what a virtuous human looks like. And we do this by exploring the world and thinking about what kind of creatures we are. That's an empirical question. You can't do that just sitting in an armchair. You can't do this a priori. You can't just think up the virtues, according to Aristotle. You have to go out and investigate the world. And if you notice how careful Aristotle was, he was always 
looking at all the available philosophical theories and all the evidence out there and weighing things up against each other and picking what seems like the best option. It's all very practical in terms of empirical for Aristotle. Kant is just denying all of that. He says, no, I can do morality without figuring out what kind of person or what kind of creature a human being is. In fact, as you'll see in the reading quiz, Kant thinks it's exactly the wrong way to do morality, to try to figure out what kind of creature the human being is. So uh, Kant and Aristotle disagree on whether morality can be answered a priori. So that's one thing. And then why did I bring up this practical reason versus theoretical reason, reason stuff? You may recall from Aristotle, sometimes we talked about practical wisdom or phrenesis as I probably should have called it more often. I did once or twice, I think. Practical wisdom is very important for Aristotle. It's about knowing what the right thing to do is. It's sort of the key part of virtue. And you might think, oh, practical wisdom sounds like practical reason. Aristotle's practical wisdom is Kant's practical reason. It's figuring out what to do. But in fact, they're very different. Kant's practical reason is a sort of, it's, it's basically like thinking about what to do. So any kind of thinking about what to do counts as practical reason. So again, figuring out what medicine to give to somebody, that's empirical practical reason. Pure practical reason is the stuff we'll read in the groundwork. So figuring out the principles of morality, sort of regardless of empirical stuff. So for Aristotle, practical wisdom is different from practical reason in two big ways, in lots of ways, but two big ways. The first is that for Aristotle, all of practical wisdom is empirical. Again, this is because of the way Aristotle thinks about ethics. To do ethics for Aristotle is to investigate the world and learn about how human beings work. So he thinks to be a virtuous person, you can't be a young person, you just don't have enough experience in the world. To get practical wisdom, you have to be brought up in the right way, you have to see lots of examples, and you have to like at, do the right thing for a while to get the hang of it, to get it in your soul, basically. And again, the soul is not a big metaphysical thing for Aristotle, it's just what makes us act. So you have to have habits of doing the right thing to have practical wisdom for Aristotle. That's a very empirical thing. You have to work at it for a while you can't learn it by reading a book. So that's very different from practical reason for Kant, because for Kant, practical reason can be pure reason, and that's in fact what the book we're going to read is about. So Kant thinks there can be pure practical reason. Aristotle doesn't think there's such thing as pure practical wisdom. That's sort of a contradiction for him. Practical wisdom is about stuff in the real world and knowing how to do things. And so that leads to the second difference between practical reason for Kant and practical wisdom for Aristotle. Practical reason for Kant, pure practical reason, the non-empirical practical reason, is about knowing what you should do, but you might not be very effective at it. So for instance, I might know what I should do. I know what my duties are, or I know what rights people have. I know what intentions I should have, but I'm just unlucky all the time. I'm never able to accomplish what I should do. Or even worse, I'm sickly, and so I can't really move, I can't get up out of my bed, so I can't do the right thing, even though I know what to do. Or I don't have enough money to do the right thing. I should help out those in need, but I have no money, so I can't help out those in need. And for Kant, you know, no problem. I've got the right intentions, so I'm a moral person. I'm as good as you can get. Why? Because I've used pure practical reason to figure out my moral duties. And I'm trying as hard as I can. It's not working. I'm getting unlucky, or I'm too sick to move, or I don't have enough money to give away. But I'm not a worse person because of that. Aristotle, meanwhile, remember, he thinks you can be a worse person if you get unlucky or if you get sick, or if you don't have enough money. You can't be virtuous, or, you, no, sorry, you can't be good, you can't be eudaimon, you can't be flourishing, you can't be happy, is the way our translation puts it, if all your children die. 
because that's just that's not what it is to be a good person. A good person, a good life doesn't include all your children dying before you. Similarly, if you sort of in principle know the right thing to do, but you can't get yourself to do it, you're just not very good at it, uh, you're too sick or whatever, sorry, you're not a good person. You're not like the worst person. The worst person doesn't even know what they should be doing. But again, for Aristotle, to be good, to be eudaimon, to be happy, you've, you've got to have some external circumstances. So whether morality is sort of immune to empirical stuff, empirical practical circumstances or not, that's a divide on which Aristotle and Kant disagree. Aristotle says morality can be sort of held hostage to practical stuff, and Kant says, no, morality is just about having the right practical reason, the right intentions, and you're good to go.